also works. No, that's not okay. Good. Uh, I think it's already obvious that we, we shifted uh, the, the program around a little bit, so it's on the board. So the, I think the key change is that Victoria has uh, put the minute talk to, uh, to the afternoon session, but we'll start 15 minutes early, and, uh, the, so we have 15 minutes less lunch. We have to eat quicker, or smoke a cigarette quicker, whatever. So we uh, so we'll start now with uh, Tito Sample. Yeah, thanks very much for the organizers to give me the opportunity uh, to talk to you today about um, our work at the Alfred Wigner Institute. So today I'm actually talking about um, one study that we did, uh, which is um, basically using NWP to assess the influence of the Arctic atmosphere on mid-latitude weather and climate. Um, so with a, with a relaxation method in a controlled way, we are doing sensitivity experiments. So basically the questions we would like to answer is, um, so by how much could weather forecasts in the northern mid-latitudes be improved if we had perfect knowledge of the Arctic? But that actually links also to the question, how much influence of the Arctic in, in what regions actually uh, the Arctic will influence bo uh, mostly the northern mid-latitudes. So, um, and under which large-scale circulation conditions is the influence strongest? So basically we are using here an NWP technique uh, to, to be able to, uh, to also in a climatological sense um, determine the influence of the, of the Arctic on the northern mid-latitudes. So um, for this, we uh, we are using the uh, we have been using the IFS model. We started basically experiments on the first and fifteenth of each month, from 1979 to 2012, and we did it for all the seasons as well. So we can also determine uh, the seasonal dependency uh, without and with relaxation applied from 75 north to 90 north. I should say. Um, about the relaxation, basically what we are doing is every time step of the IFS model, which is um, three quarters of an hour, we are drawing um, the state of the Arctic atmosphere north of 75 degrees north with a smooth transition actually between 65 and 85 degrees north um, towards the state of, uh, of the reanalyzed uh, re data. And the reanalysis data are actually the data from ECMWF, which we are also using to initialize all these, um, all these experiments. So that basically we have one set which freely evolves like, um, like a normal NWP forecast model, and, and um, then one experiment um, which, which is drawn towards uh, the observed or reanalyzed state. So and the good thing is, um, in such an NWP setting, we are of course able to afford with limited computing power uh, to afford quite a large ensemble. So we have actually 204 start points for each season. And um, we evaluate the difference in mean absolute error of the forecasts. So uh, these curves uh, look certainly quite familiar. In in fact, actually, Erland Cullen has shown something similar already, uh, kind of how, how the uh, root mean square error is growing, um, is growing uh, with increasing time, increasing forecast time. And um, I think he showed just up to 10 days. I'm showing here um, up to 14 days, which is the length of our experiments. And you can see here you're already going into the saturation. Uh, meaning that that we are already um, already getting towards uh, kind of the climatological error of the model, or I should say the uh, the variability 
uh, the, the um, internal variability of the model and also, I suppose, of the observed atmosphere. So um, here I should now say we have the, the four different seasons, as I indicated before, and we have a solid line and a dashed line each. The dashed line is actually um, the, uh, the um, relaxed forecasts where we have the information um, of the Arctic atmosphere from the reanalysis data and the solid line is the one uh, which is without relaxation and we are looking here at averages over the whole northern mid-latitudes 40 to 60 degrees north. So as you can see um, it, it doesn't do an awful lot uh, basically this uh, this relaxation you so you could argue the Arctic influence is not that strong on on the northern mid latitudes so uh, what one can also see of course what is an important feature that in summer you have less variability than in the other um, the other seasons and uh, yeah that's that's of course also also an important information we come back to this uh, later so this is just basically the same, just, uh, just the difference between, between the two forecasts, uh, relaxed minus, uh, minus not relaxed, uh, kind of to see what is actually the forecast improvement averaged over the whole mid-latitudes if we relaxed the Arctic atmosphere towards the reanalyzed state. And you see we are indeed just in the order of 5% if we consider the whole mid-latitudes. It's also true if we, if we pick out um, uh, the European region, but the interesting thing is uh, over northern Asia, actually we get quite a strong um, increase or quite a strong uh, improvement of, th of the forecasts through Arctic relaxation. So that is, that is uh, of course, something interesting. Over North and North America, it's again similar similar around 5%. Uh, so, and uh, if we now look, um, just to explain this a little bit, um, if we look, if we look here um, at the, at the, um, just the mean circulation, this is just uh, the mean Z500 field, 500 hectopascal geopotential height. Um, and it is, it is basically as a mean, as an end, also the deviation from the zonal average to see a little bit the wave structure, the climatological wave structure. I, in winter and in spring, what we can see over the continents, basically we have a climatological uh, deviation from the mean westerly flow uh, from the north with a northerly component and over the maritime areas, uh, we are looking at the opposite, kind of more a southerly component in the mean westerly flow. And this is, of course, very important for the Arctic influence. And so now we are looking at, um, at summer and autumn, basically the same pictures. First of all, you see, as I already said, in summer we have, we have of course, um, actually not only uh, only uh, less variability, which c can be explained by the weaker, weaker gradient in general. So even if you have here waves going around, they will be with a, uh, with a weaker intensity. Uh, but also, um, of course, you see that, that actually, yeah, the deviation from the zonal average is, is less. And then that explains the clearly lower standard deviation and also the lower forecast error in the Z500 field in, um, in the summer season. And um, in autumn, it kind of goes back again uh, to a stronger meridional gradient of the Z500 and also stronger, stronger uh, wave patterns. But of course, the winter was clearly, uh, clearly the strongest here. And um, so now if we look at uh, the mean absolute error reduction in the Z500, uh, again compared uh, with relaxation and without relaxation, we see um, that, that basically, of course, ob very obviously where we apply the relaxation, we get a huge reduction in percent of the mean absolute error. This is, of course, by, uh, by definition of the experiments, so no surprise. What we are interested here is actually what happens in the, in the mid-latitude ring. 
uh, over 40 to 60 degrees north. And um, basically we see the strongest uh, reduction of the forecast error here in, in this area in Western Asia, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, so here we're actually talking about something around 15%, uh, which is clearly more than the 5% in the average over the whole mid-latitudes. And um, so in the days four to seven, uh, the uh, signal is still a little bit more confined, but in days 8 to 14, the signal also spreads out to the more southern latitudes. And um, so in, in spring, you generally still see a similar, uh, a similar picture, maybe with a little bit less intensity, as I explained before, which was expected. In summer, uh, the whole thing uh, gets, gets more patchy, and in autumn, we are getting back again to the, to, the stronger, to the stronger influence of the Arctic. So, because of course, it's also important to know what, I mean, we were talking all the time about Z500 and more than five kilometers height above the surface. So how about um, close to the surface, which matters more for society? Um, so actually, um, here the main message is that, that we are still getting similar features. It's a little bit more patchy, though. Um, the, but nevertheless, uh, the main message, I would, I would say, still remains, uh, remains the same, also close to the surface. So now I would like come, uh, to come to another topic. So basically, we have now seen what is, uh, what is the mean influence of the, of the Arctic to the northern mid-latitudes. But how about um, if we are now looking at forecasts which have been especially strongly improved compared to the non-relaxed forecasts? So if we, if we apply the relaxation and we get an especially strong improvement of the forecast, so here we are actually looking at, at composites uh, where we only pick the forecasts with the strongest reduction of the forecast error. And we compare those basically, uh, basically to the ones uh, where, we, uh, where we have uh, basically a normal forecast reduction or even a very small forecast reduction. So we are we actually using one standard deviation um, to, to define this cutoff of the, of the forecast <coughs> improvement. So basically it is of course interesting to, to know now in what situations happens that the, that the Arctic has strongest influence uh, on the mid-latitudes. And as you can see, I mean, it's in a way, so we focused actually on different regions, but uh, especially over, over this Western, uh, Western Asia, Eastern Europe area, um, we found basically the strongest patterns, and that's why I focus here. So it is going back to, uh, again, also the influence from the Barents Sea, Kara Sea area, which we have heard already about um, uh, from Paolo, and also which has been uh, studied in previous literature. It has been already identified as a key, uh, key area. <coughs> so um, basically, when we have an anomalous northerly flow from the Arctic uh, towards Western Asia, Eastern Europe, we get the strongest forecast reductions. This is especially true in winter. In, in spring and autumn, it's kind of also visible a little bit, but in, in summer, uh, hardly visible. Again, um, uh, due to the arguments I had given before. So, and it's of course also interesting what happens to the two meter temperature if we look at the, if we look at the um, strongly improved forecasts over this, um, over this uh, Western Asia region. So, um, basically what we see is we actually uh, get cold anomalies up to three Kelvin, which is quite substantial uh, in, in, these, uh, in these situations. And um, so these cold anomalies due, uh, due to basically the, um, um, the circulation anomalies, um, which, which we had seen before. So basically, um, if you imagine that this anomalous flow goes around here, it will of course influence then uh, 
uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe as well. That's why you can see that these cold anomalies actually are not only over Western Asia, but also over uh, Central, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And then, of course, um, these are the experiments which have the strongest uh, Arctic influence, uh, where basically the relaxation helps the strongest uh, to actually improve the weather forecast. So you can, of course, draw the conclusion or hypothesize that, um, that in, situ in such situations, the performance of the model may be poor and uh, you are getting an extremely strong improvement um, due, to the relax due to the relaxation. <laughs> so, and this is of course going back a little bit to this discussion, um, how, about the, um, how about basically, uh, can the models really capture these Arctic mid-latitude linkage as well? So basically now I'm coming to the conclusions. Uh, we have, um, yeah, Basically, uh, basically, over northwestern Asia, we have the strongest forecast improvements and therefore the strongest Arctic north, north and mid-latitude linkages. And uh, we have also a, a minor pathway over North and North America. It could be, um, yeah, basically, basically there, of course, uh, when we also included a little bit more the west of Northern America, we also included a partition where where is uh, a southerly flow. One could also play around uh, with these target areas a little bit more. But in any case, um, there is a secondary a secondary pathway also to north from the Arctic to North America. So, um, and as I discussed already, maybe uh, we are uh, we are here uh, finding. Uh, an indication for poor representation of, of uh, these northerly flow anomalies in, in the model. And um, so also what is interesting, what I didn't go into detail during the presentation, is we also looked at, because of course the Arctic sea ice has been shrinking a lot during the, during the last 34 years, or, and uh, we were basically interested, would we actually see um, an increased meridionality, as some um, studies uh, show, like, for example, uh, Francis et al. Uh, but uh, we can actually not detect uh, that the Arctic influence has been increasing uh, during this time period we investigated, basically, uh, basically because we have the whole set from 1979 to 2012, and we were, we were thinking maybe we get kind of a stronger, stronger forecast reduction if the meridionality increases in, in these key areas, but we don't really see that. So thanks very much for your attention.